Hello and welcome back to Metanauts. I'm Lee Mason, also known as Metageist. And in this episode, the Metanauts team drove 600 miles round trip up to Scotland to talk to Trevor Jones in his studio. Some of you may have heard of Trevor Jones, but for those of you who haven't, he's one of the most successful NFT artists in the space. And we talk a little bit about where he came from, how he was pioneering digital art and no one was paying any attention in the early years and how he's shot to fame over the last couple of years in the NFT space, what it's like navigating that new fame. And we get a little bit of insight into some of the stuff he's working on right now. So without further ado, let's dive right in. So here we are in Trevor Jones' studio in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, I understand you were born in Canada, is that right? You're Canadian? I how was did born you in Canada, yes. Find yourself here? Uh, I always say it was a backpacking trip gone wrong. Um, I left in 1996 to Australia and just started kind of traveling around the world um, just with a backpack and ended up in Scotland in 1999. Uh, and I just ended up staying. So it was completely unexpected. Um, what started as a, a, a little trip around the world ended up uh, was in the 20 years here now. Wow. And were you a painter and artist of any kind at that point? No, no, not really at all. Um, I enjoyed art when I was younger, but uh, it was never a plan to become an artist. So uh, yeah, it was a, a bit of a surprise to myself and to pretty much everybody in my life and around me that I decided after a few years living in Scotland that I wanted to be an artist and go to art college. Um, it, uh, it was the strangest decision uh, imaginable, especially because I was 32 years old when, oh, right. when okay. I made that decision. Was that inspired by anybody in particular or any art you saw around here or just the, no. the city is so beautiful? Uh, personal crisis. Right. Um, yeah. So. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'd been living and working here for a few years and, uh, you know, I was kind of came to a, a crossroads in my life. Uh, I was working crazy hard. I was partying even harder and uh, a lot of bad things happened all at the same time. And I had like a little bit of a... Uh, a crisis and put it that way. And I, I decided I needed to find something that would um, save me. You know, I was ended up um, suffering from depression, which I'd never suffered from before. You know, it was a, a entirely new experience for me. And uh, for whatever reason I was going through at that point in time, I thought I need to, I need to find some, something meaningful in my life, some, something that would fulfill me. And for whatever reason, I thought art would do it. And even though I didn't know why, uh, I ended up going to a little art, independent art school here called Leith School of Art and essentially cried my way in because I didn't have a portfolio. I had nothing. Uh, they gave me a, a sketchbook. This was about three weeks before kind of term time started. They gave me a, a sketchbook. They said, fill this up uh, and come back and we'll talk. So I was just out every day drawing whatever I could see, trees, rocks, my hand. And I came back and for whatever reason, I mean, it was just, I still have the sketchbook. It's really, really bad drawings. <laughs> but the fact that I, I did it yeah. um, and they let me in. So that was the foundation year uh, in whatever, 2002, 2003. And I managed to make it through that, suffering terribly from depression, um, but made it through and applied to Edinburgh College of Art and then spent the next five years doing the MA Fine Art there. Wow. Okay. So you ever wonder what, how life would have been different if you hadn't have been given that sketchbook and things like that? So it's like completely it different. definitely, uh, obviously changed your life forever. Like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of working in hospitality. That's, I was traveling around the world and working in restaurants and managing restaurants. And I, that was always kind of what I saw myself doing for the rest of my life, you know, owning a little pub somewhere, yeah. um, or a little restaurant, a uh, cafe. Uh, but then when it all came crashing down and I needed to, to find myself, it was art that I turned to. And how long was it before you sold your first piece? Do you remember that? Uh, actually, yeah, it was the the year end show of that Lee School of Art, the very first little foundation year that, um, and I did a, a life drawing, I think it was like an A2 size, uh, and I sold it for 30 pounds. <laughs> and I was the happiest you could imagine. I was like, I made it, yeah. I've done it, 30 pounds. Yeah, <laughs> I made weird. money from art. Yeah, you're very validating, isn't it, when that happens? Yeah, yeah. A few years passed, I, I guess, before the synesthesia exhibition that you put on. Yeah. I've seen some of the paintings from that on, you posted on Twitter, and you did uh, share that recently. Um, but that was a big deal, right? That must have 
that was a proper full on solo exhibition yeah, and yeah. a success. Uh, it was, yeah. I mean, so I graduated in 2008 and my first solo show was in 2010, which was, you know, quite a success story in itself that, um, you know, I mean, kind of a, a middle of the road Edinburgh gallery, uh, not kind of the, you know, a, a giant New York gallery or London gallery type thing, but still having a, a solo show mm -hmm. um, so soon after graduating uh, was a, a huge, huge event for me. Um, and it was a, a, a master success. I think I sold about 80, 85 percent of the paintings. Uh, and then the next year I had another solo show at a different gallery. And again, it was it was very successful, um, you know, all things considered. So I was managing to kind of establish myself in the, the Edinburgh art scene. Uh, I was also running an arts charity uh, based here at the, the studio called Art and Healthcare. Um, and that, I, that was hugely rewarding because we, as a charity, um, we put paintings into hospitals. Uh, we did put on art workshops for um, you know, people at care homes, uh, people with disabilities. Uh, so again, it was that me, using art um, and, and, and then my art knowledge to find a way to, to bring respite to other people who were looking for some kind of help or, mm. or something in their life. So, so I was doing all the, all the right things. You know, I, I loved my job with art and healthcare. I was having six, some successful shows, but I found out fairly quickly after, like, especially the second show, that um, I just couldn't make any money from painting because by the time the show was finished, uh, you know, the, the gallery took their 45 to 50 percent. I paid a couple grand for framing, you know, all my kind of overhead as a, a, an artist with gal studio hire and, and, and so on. That essentially I was coming up with just enough money to keep me going for another six months to keep on painting and buy some more materials. Um, so yeah, it was by 2011 that I, I thought I need to find some way to differentiate myself from other artists. I think, you know, the fact that I was older was good and bad because in one, some ways I was on the back foot. You know, there were so many artists around me who were my age, who had graduated 15 years before, who were exceptionally talented, had kind of established themselves in the, the art scene here. Uh, and as well, there were, there were younger artists who were really, really gifted. And I'm thinking like, geez, you know, this is, how am I going to, to make this work? How, you know, I was, I had, I made it work by just working loads of jobs, you know, so I was working pretty much full time for the charity. I was um, teaching part time uh, art at the little art school that I went to for the foundation year. Uh, I was running the Airbnb year round with, I had two spare rooms and I was painting towards exhibitions. So, um, you know, I was literally working seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day for years. And then kind of coming to the conclusion that this is, I can't do this for the rest of my life. It's not going to work. So I needed to find a way to somehow, like I said, separate myself from all the other artists in the space um, and, and see how that went. So it was a, a calculated risk and it only took, what's that, probably uh, 10 years for it to pay off. Right, yeah. <laughs> I often use you as an example when I'm talking to other people about maybe working their way into NFTs as traditional artists, because they say, well, I'm not a digital artist. And I say, well, one of the highest grossing, one of the most successful NFT artists in the whole space is a painter. But what you did at that point, I guess, where we're getting to is the QR codes and the AR and that sort of stuff. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about those experiments that you did yep. quite early on in like your QR code technology, I suppose, if no one else was doing it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was um, on the lead up to that 2011 solo show that I saw, uh, I started seeing these QR codes around on packaging and, and this and that, and, and I didn't know what it was. And so just being curious, I started to Google investigate and then realize, okay, this is a, basically a kind of interesting barcode. You can get an app on your phone, you can scan it and it'll lead you to new information, whatever it is. So I thought, okay, I, I, I was working towards this show. I was creating post, I, I did a lot of the marketing myself. You know, it's usually up to the commercial gallery to do all the kind of marketing side, but um, I wanted to play a part in that and ensure that, you know, that I'd have the most successful show I possibly could. So I would always do my side of the marketing as well. I'd create postcards and hand them out to people or to um, you know potential buyers, 
And I thought, okay, I can put a QR code on this postcard, which would then people could scan it and go to my website and they could find out more information about the, the, the exhibition. And I thought, okay, that's really, really cool. Um, there's a new opportunity to provide information for people to learn about my artwork. So before the exhibition even opened, I was already, I'd finished all the paintings. They are in framers getting framed. I thought, what if I actually painted a QR code? You know, that's, that's really interesting um, because then the painting becomes something more, you know, it becomes a, a window to another dimension. I had a, a friend, oh, actually I was working with him at Art and Healthcare. He was our, our tech guy. Um, he built our website for us. And so I went to him and said like, I want to create QR code paintings. Can I do that? You know, it's like, so then we started working together. It was, you know, so right from interesting as well that, you know, back, I've been working in kind of in the collaborative sense for, for a decade without even realizing it was collaboration. I was just saying, I'm, I just want to make paintings, but with tech, but thanks to him, David, uh, he, he was the one who really opened up this opportunity for me with technology because I'm definitely not the most techy guy around. I'm not afraid of it, but uh, he would be the one I'd say like, I've got this idea. And he'd be like, yeah, we can do that. It's okay. Okay. What about AR? So oh, yeah, we can do that too. Um, so yeah. So then I started painting after the exhibition, the 2011 one, I started to uh, paint these QR codes. And as you can see, mm -hmm. um, it was uh, a year of painting with you know, a paintbrush in one hand and a phone in the other because you'd have to scan. I incorporated 25 to 30% error correction in the, into the paintings, into the QR code, so I could be quite loose with the, the kind of expressiveness of the paint. It wasn't all, had to be completely straight, straight edge lines. Does that mean any of those squares can be in a different position or do they still have to be in the same position, but it can, it's softer and it's different yes, tones? Yes, exactly. So they have to be in the same position, yeah. but uh, if I, I incorporated like 0% like error correction, then I would have to tape everything off or right. and, and every line would have to be perfect. So having 25%, I could be a little bit more expressive with the paint. I could get quick, thick, juicy oil paint and, and mess about. The problem with that was that occasionally, um, or quite often, it would stop scanning and I'm like, okay, now I have no idea what I did wrong. Oh, right. Yeah. So I, it, yeah. Cause it's every, every brush trick. I suppose yeah, you've got yeah. to check. Yeah. Okay. So then I have to slowly kind of think, okay, okay. What's uh, what needs to be tightened up. And I tighten up a little bit, scan it again. It's like, no, it's like tighten up something else. Like, you know, so it was a really arduous process of creating a painting based entirely on my phone and, and the technology. Um, but, what we did with David and I, we then built a, a website that became like an online gallery and any artist in the world could upload their work to that gallery with their contact information. Um, I like the idea that it wasn't a, in the sense of a, a dead end painting with technology. So I did see a couple artists in around the world using QR codes. But for example, you'd scan it and just go to their website, you know, or you'd scan it and go to like a piece of text, you know, some poetry, which is quite nice. But mm -hmm. I thought, well, this is the opportunity to create something bigger. Um, and so I thought, what about my painting itself or these paintings, these series of paintings become, like I said, this window to another dimension of an entirely new gallery with artists from all around the world and, and their artwork on the website and their contact details. And so people then I'm able to introduce anybody who sees my paintings to a whole new world of other artists. Um, so that was, you know, I thought like, this is amazing. I can bring people together through my painting who from different sides of the, of the world, um, you know, ex experiencing other people's art, uh, potentially buying from them all through a, a, a single painting. And at the time we were like, this is amazing. You know, this is going to be like the biggest thing ever. And I ended up like, getting completely rejected by everybody for these paintings. You know, no galleries want to show them. I entered them into juried competitions and the RSA Open, the Royal Scottish Academy Open, rejection, rejection, rejection. Nobody liked the paintings. So I was going to ask you, did they sell at all did they, or anything like that? So I suppose they got, you've probably got collectors now that are interested. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. Well, um, eventually, uh, the one gallery that I had my second, yeah, it was my second solo show at, uh, they created um, a, a, a curated exhibition that was curated by my um, my university art history professor. And I said, look, Bill, you know, I've got these really cool paintings. Uh, they need to be shown. And so he invited me into this exhibition with, I think it was about eight 
other abstract artists that were all much, much older than I was, um, kind of kind of staple of the of the abstract scene in, in Scotland. So it was an honor to be a part of it. But my paintings kind of stuck out, stood out like a, a sore thumb next to these kind of 1960s, 1970s abstract expressionists. Mm. Um, but I ended up actually selling all four of them to uh, one buyer who had been buying from me for like almost every year for the last three years and has, has now actually been my, my biggest buyer ever of physical art. So he, for whatever reason, bought all four of them, and uh, which was amazing because that gave me a bit of financial freedom to, to start kind of exploring more technology, which then led me to augmented reality the next year in 2013. That's really interesting that somebody saw it, saw the, the, the potential there as, as, a, as, a, as a divergent thinker doing something unusual and there's still a supporter now. Because mm-hmm. what you've done there is you've created a piece of artwork that has essentially become like a portal or like you say, a window into, and, and it was a community of other artists, right? Mm-hmm. It's the sort of stuff that NFTs are doing now before you'd ever heard of NFTs, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that's before crypto as well. But well, you know, before, well, that was uh, 2011, 12, when I started painting the QR codes. Right, yeah. So it would have been, you know, about the time of Bitcoin. Yeah, when you'd and, like to have known about Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's been uh, quite the journey. Uh, there was a company at the time called Layer, and we that was my very first AR painting in, in 2013. And it turned into, I decided I wanted to create, this is an amazing opportunity to, to layer stories into a painting. So it, instead of just a static image, that the painting itself would turn into something. And so I had uh, somebody animate all those characters from all those figures. And you could scan the painting. There was music and all these characters started to dance around and you know, with the umbrellas and uh, the little girl was jumping up and down in a, pool of water and the little boy was playing his his cello there um, and you know people were spinning their umbrellas and you could literally click on each individual character which would then lead you to a web the, our website page that was built specifically for these paintings and people could then uplo- upload their own story their own narrative oh, amazing. and I like the idea that you know I could get anybody from around the world to you know scan this image either on the physical painting or you know, an image of it in a magazine or postcard or whatever, and then upload their own stories and, and other people could then comment, comment on them. So again, it was about bringing a community of people together around a painting through technology. Uh, and I created two paintings the same size. I was going to create seven um, all around, designed around the kind of seven basic plots of, of storylines and narratives. Uh, and I ran out of money. And Nobody actually liked the paintings either, so I couldn't sell the paintings, which is why, I mean, I probably could sell that painting for a lot of money now. It was my very first AR painting yeah, um, with such a story, and I just, I couldn't give it away. I mean, I was trying to sell it for, like, peanuts, and, like, nobody wanted it. Did that use the, the whole painting as a marker, or did you have to use a barcode or something at that point? That was the whole painting. Oh, it was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even know yeah. you could do that that, that, that yeah. early on. I, I, saw, I didn't see that for years after. It, it was a Layer, and then I think Blipper was... I remember London. Blipper. That's yeah. when I first yeah. saw it. Um, that was on packaging and stuff. And yeah. It was the first time I saw 3D AR, that totally blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, jumped yeah. Out the page. It's crazy, and how it's moved on. I mean, it's like, I need to, yeah, it's crazy. So it, it was uh, another company, Matteo, a uh, German-based company, who once Layer... Kind of priced me out of their market because the the technology was being used more for big companies and marketing um, packages. So as an artist, I just couldn't afford what, especially for the, the fact that I couldn't actually sell anything anyway. Um, the costs of the the AR technology. So we then moved to a, a company called Matteo, and I think it was I'm not sure how much it was like a thousand dollars or something for uh, a lifetime subscription, which was I could afford that. Uh, and it was they were a brilliant company. They actually invited me to Barcelona for the World Mobile. Um, um, basically, it was a, a tech conference. It was absolutely massive, and I so I got to meet the team. But I was really the only artist they knew of that was using the technology. That was in 2014, um, and they were really really supportive because I was doing something so unique with their technology that they they supplied. Uh, and so in the lead up to my 2015 exhibition, Edward Hacked, uh, they were absolutely kind of behind me a full, and I was like, this is it, you know, this is my, my big break. And about three weeks before the exhibition opened up, 
they just disappeared and went radio silent. They, they, I couldn't find out anything that all their Twitter accounts were kind of deleted. All right. And I found out that um, about maybe a week before the exhibition started that Apple bought them. Oh. And they basically just. Right. You know, Shelved it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I was like, oh my God, this is a you know, disaster. It's like, you know, my show is coming up. And uh, eventually I managed to get in touch with somebody from there and they, they explained to me what happened and they were super cool. They ended up um, giving us a, a, their SDK, which I think was about 5,000 uh, euros at the time for free. And David actually built an AR app for me. With yeah, you their, were on Bespoke yeah, app, right? Yeah, yeah I remember yeah. seeing that, yeah. Um, so I managed to get the exhibition for 2015 on on show. That's when I was actually hiring my own gallery spaces because no galleries were, were interested in, sell, in showing this stuff anyway. Uh, so yeah, we managed to make it through that. It was that SDK ran out. Uh, I think after about six months. So then that was the, the next big step with David. We decided, okay, there's obviously, I thought at the time, uh, a demand, a need for a low cost augmented reality platforms for artists because we can't afford five hundred, a thousand, or five thousand, you know, euros mm. or pounds, whatever for for the tech. Most artists can't. So we ended up, um, I got some private funding uh, from a couple of people I know to build, to establish a company called Creative Tech. Uh, that was in 2015. And we, or David, built uh, the AR app Creative Muse, which we then, the plan was to kind of sell, I think it was like 40 pounds for a year membership and 20 augmented reality uh, experiences. And again, you know, that was like six years ago. There were no artists who wanted to really? use it. I was trying. I was oh, trying I'd have to, jumped on that if I'd have seen that. At that I know, time. I know. But I mean, you, you, you just probably come from a different it, background. Yeah, but I was showing it. I was showing it at different art fairs, um, talking to artists about it. I was t- still teaching at the little art school, and nothing. You know, there was like such a apprehension and a skepticism towards by traditional artists, traditional painters towards technology. Um, you know, I had, I remember having a conversation with one and she was saying like, basically you, you sold out. I'm like, sold out. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, selling an artist selling out is basically taking somebody else's successful you yeah. know, idea and, and copying them and then saying it's, it's theirs. I'm doing something that nobody else has done yeah. and putting a lot of money and, and effort and timing into it and getting nothing but rejection. That's not selling out. Yeah, that's a weird take, isn't it? Yeah. And that, that mirrors a lot of people's responses to NFTs as well. Yeah, They're that that it's, it's such an alien thing that they'd rather just dismiss it than try and understand it. That's that's what that sounds like. Absolutely, yeah. So it was, uh, yeah. We ended up, we actually just wound down the company um, the end of last year, about whatever six seven months ago, because we were running it for five years, and I was just constantly putting money into it to to keep. We weren't making any money. We were just I was just losing money on it, uh, and. It was confusing for me to to see all this possibility that that this new technologies could could give an artist to to create stories, to add layers to their their artwork, to to bring a, a, a painting to life um, in a way that had never been done before, and and there was literally no uptake on it from the yes. traditional art world. Yeah, because you're showing great examples. And it only takes a little bit of imagination to think how you can incorporate it into your own art, artwork, isn't it? It's, yeah. It is, it's adding animation, layers, music, anything like that to an existing painting. You'd think that people would be able to sort of see that. But I guess ultimately it just goes to show that, you know, that's why a lot of, lots of um, mavericks and unusual artists and weirdos are drawn to crypto art and that this sort of space is because they are the ones that are trying to do something cutting edge and they're kind of like on their own and, and, mm-hmm. and sort of floating around. And you've been rejected by galleries. These people haven't taken up your app and like... Uh, and yet NFTs, you, uh, you've done really well out of it, haven't you? So yeah, yeah. Um, it's fair play for sticking to your guns and not like just losing all faith in in, in the arts. There were so many times I'm just thinking like, oh God, you know. I mean, with the company, I, we put. I, I think. Um, I mean, I, I personally put about almost twenty grand into into it over five years, and I had to work so many different jobs. Even with you know once. You know, 2018 came along and I was selling my crypto theme paintings like the bull here uh, and started to to make some you know money for the first time really in, in my life. Uh, it was just getting sucked into creative tech. And, and I thought, okay, I need to, 
now there's Art of Eye, for example, and there's mm -hmm. other um, platforms. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's more widespread. You can find really really good platforms out there. But some are still struggling. Like I, I've seen one just completely disappear, arise, just, just stop working now. Yeah. And it's because I think it's partly because, and maybe this is why some of the artists didn't take up, take up your offer, is that once you're committed to adding animation and music, you've got to make all that animation. You've got to yeah. understand how to use After Effects or, or make some music or whatever. So it becomes a much bigger project, yeah. I think. And so you have to have like the idea, you have to be, the idea has to be strong enough that you persist and actually do all that extra yeah. work to make that happen. But that leads me right back to what I said before about me needing to separate myself, to differentiate myself from other artists. And, I, and so that's what I did. That, so I took that risk, you know, and put that time and money into it. Um, and, you know, so many different um, rejection letters and emails. And um, because I just, I saw a, a future in it. Um, and, you know, and I guess maybe I'm, I'm an optimist because I honestly thought with the QR codes, like, this is it, you know, boom, I, this, I, I figured it out. You know, this, mm -hmm. this I'm going to be New York galleries and London galleries are going to be calling me up. And it's like, you know, Trev, this is amazing. You know, we need to show your work. It's like nothing. And then it's like when I discovered AR, it's like, oh, God, I need to do something quick because as soon as other artists find yeah. out about this, it's going to be everywhere. Like seven years later, it's like nobody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like tumbleweeds. <laughs> so, I, but I was always the optimist. I always thought something's going to happen eventually. Like, you know, technology is, is taking over the world. And as an artist, you know, living in a, a very, you know, growing up in this kind of traditional art world, uh, I, 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 I just, it was a, like I said, a calculated risk that eventually I thought that the, the traditional art world will, will catch up and, and then welcome me with open arms. It's like, you know, come on in again. And, uh, and yet that never happened. It was the, the tech world. It was the, these, you know, even before, um, you know, like cryptocurrency and, and my 2018 crypto disruption, uh, you know, there were some, you know, tech companies and, and writers who were interested in my QR code paintings. Uh, it wasn't anybody from the art world, you know, the, the AR paintings, it was, you know, the tech, um, enthusiasts who are going like, this is really, really cool. You know, we, we like art, but we don't really understand it, but we, we like what you're doing. Mm. So yeah, I mean, when I discovered cryptocurrency in 2017 and started to invest or lose my, my money very quickly through that, um, <laughs> it, uh, I, I then found a whole community of, of like I said, innovators and, and forward thinkers and, and, and tech um, geniuses who saw my paintings with the with the technology and the AR and the NFC tags and the the QR codes and going like, that's pretty cool. You know, it's like, you know, and, and they were the ones that welcomed me with open arms. So yeah, it's it it the the journey got to where I wanted it to go, where I'm now a full time, you know, working artist and, and making money at it. And you don't need but, the fine art world. And I don't need exactly <laughs> I don't I don't need the the traditional legacy art world. I don't need, you know, any of them anymore. And we were talking about this before, you know, this interview that, you know, if I'm quite happy where I am, you know, in this, this space, you know, in this community that if, you know, the, there's the support, there's, uh, there's people who absolutely love what I do. There's people who want to, you know, buy what I, what I create, um, people who get it. It's not a constant, like, you know, hitting my head against the wall, trying to say like, but this is really cool. Like, mm -hmm. look at this. You know, I don't have to say that. So yeah, it's, it, it starts with the tech. It's born of the tech. It's an art world that's come out of tech, hasn't it? Yeah. Rather than rather than the other way around. So yeah, that makes sense. It's like a, it was a match made in heaven, really. You yeah. just have to wait for the technology to catch <laughs> it was up. With you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so something to say for perseverance. Um, you know, and I, I I see those conversations on Twitter quite often. You know, and um, you know, you're not making a lot of money right now as a, as an artist in the space. Um, but you know, give it time. You know, okay, okay, there are okay, there are some examples where you know an artist just kind of like boom, you know, is, makes you know makes it like that. But in the in the art world, that seldom happens. You know, yeah. and usually never happens to mm. to even be making a living. So for the people in this space, you know, to even be selling, especially during COVID, when so many artists, traditional artists, are are completely destroyed, we, we need to be super grateful, um, all of us for. You know, and me especially because, like I said, this 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 whole space changed my life. 
So, um, yeah, speaking of NFTs, I want to read a little quote to you. Absolutely, there will be an explosion of creativity, chaos, money, ego clashes, infighting, tribalism, thievery and chances, get-rich-quick schemes, and an entire mess of information that art historians are going to have to spend 100 years sifting through to make any sense of all this. Fun times. Now, that was you in a DM to me, April 2020. <laughs> so my, my question to you is, like, are you some sort of oracle? Because that, that pretty much sums up the last year in the NFT space pretty much to a T. <laughs> oh, my God, that's hilarious. Um, so that was April, uh, and that was, like, whatever, three or four months before the Picasso's bull drop on Nifty Gateway. Yeah, I didn't realize I was going to be that spot on. It kind of revealed its, it, itself, um, you know, really to me uh, after the Picasso's bold drop. And, and, you know, and again, like, I want to say, like, the, the, the space is amazing. You know, there's so many supportive people, so many friends that I've met, um, you know, lifelong friends. Mm. I guess after the, the, my first drop with um, a lot of money, the ETH girl drop, and, and it was, I mean, absolutely massive. It was $10,000 drop. Um, which completely kind of shattered all records. That was the end of 2019. And like I said to you before, you know, it, before that, 2018, I was the, you know, the traditional kind of painter guy in the crypto art space. Um, and there were a lot of these kind of mavericks just around that kind of came together. It was very small. Mm. There wasn't, um, you know, there, it was more about just kind of doing something that was of interest to you that, you know, and, and kind of exploring. Uh, and then what, once that ETH girl, uh, NFT dropped, and I think that really opened up, um, this, the space kind of in the sense of the economics of it mm. and the potential, mm. uh, and, and some big buyers. So it was like mod motorats or moderats and, uh, whale shark were kind of the, the two that were in that. And then soon, uh, Basilius came onto the scene and, and then all of a sudden, you know, the everybody's trying to get a piece of the pie, and so that's when I and that's when things, you know, especially in the the Twitter world, became a bit more toxic, mm. a little bit more tense, mm. um, and that only, um, you know, turned turned they turned up the volume by uh, to eleven by the time the Picasso's bull mm. drop happened, and uh, I think as uh, as artists. We're all inherently insecure. As human beings, we're all inherently insecure. Um, we want to be liked. We want to be appreciated. Uh, but also, as artists, we put our heart and souls up for people to to critique um, and to, to potentially, um, you know, shoot down. And so, I think we're, as artists, we're constantly on the back foot. Um, you know feeling that we need to defend ourselves. But at the same time, we're always questioning, it's like, you know, well, why is that artist, you know, doing so well? It's like, what happened? You know, it's like, and, and so it gets to the point where, um, you know, people aren't thinking about the work anymore. I think they're thinking about the, the dynamics of the space and, and where they position themselves or where they think they should be in that space. And it, it, can, it can get, um, yeah, it can get pretty tense. You know, and and with the success, my success, and I, I owe everything to this space and, and to so many people in this space. I'm constantly feeling like I need to to be careful, um, to be careful what I say, and I do say some things online that are stupid, and you know, and I shouldn't, and it just fucking causes outrage, and, and it's like, oh man, it's like you know, and then Violet gets mad at me, it's like, <laughs> the fuck's wrong with you, Trevor? You're such a stupid, you know, it's like, oh no, and it's like. And then, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, so it's just easier for me to, to kind of keep my head down, focus on the work, uh, and, and try to stay out of all the politics, which is hard because it seems that this whole space right now, and has been for quite some time, about money and politics and, and not, you know, back in 2018 when it was just some random artists kind of creating stuff because having liked fun it. really yeah. before yeah, but yeah before it was about the money yeah. really you, obviously you would have seen the potential for a new market there was a market there but um like you say until large numbers are getting thrown around and stuff there wasn't like a wave of new people coming in trying to get a piece of the pie and then it becomes 
political, then it becomes tribal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you've made a lot of friends and you're definitely an ambassador for collaborations in the space. And you've had quite a few really successful collaborations with some different artists, including uh, Park and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, the fusion, uh, the collision drop was really, really cool. I, I grabbed myself a copy of fusion. I really loved that the, your sort of completely different styles married so well. Um, do you want to talk about how your collaborations, how they came about with either of those projects? Or? Uh, I mean, ab absolutely. Um, collaborations have been absolutely integral to, I think, my progression and development in my career. Uh, I mean, like I, I said before that, you know, with um, my mate David, who was my, my tech guru, helped me out with all these things. I didn't at the time see it as in the sense is collaboration because I was like focused on, on these paintings for an exhibition and he was, um, my friend helped me with the tech side of things. But looking back now, especially as I came into this space and there's just so many um, innovative people with so many skills, skill sets of, you know, art and technology that absolutely, you know, David was a, a huge part of my development in, in, in my career, which then, you know, so led me to, for example, like a lot of money with my ETH drop. I didn't know what an NFT was until um, it was April 2019. Uh, and I didn't know, I didn't understand how, you know, I was somebody was, I was David um, Moore from Known Origin. He was talking to me at the Manchester CoinFest uh, conference and he's trying to explain to me why I should be excited about NFTs. And I'm like, and we talked for about like half an hour. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. You know, this is you know, like, you know, and I was like, yeah, just shaking my head. It's like, you know, or nodding. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Interesting. In interesting. Um, and then going like, no, that's not going to be for me. There's no, I don't see, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see any connection with what I was doing. Um, but then, you know, probably by about the summer, uh, you know, a few months later, I started to see people like a lot of money coming into the space and, and, and creating NFTs and, and there was a, a mark, people were buying them. And I'm like, why, why is somebody buying a JPEG? That doesn't make any sense. So I was doing more research and, and looking from a distance. And, and then I think eventually I got in touch with a lot to, and I said, you know, dude, you know, you know a lot about this space that, you know, can we maybe work together on something? Because I have no idea how, how to even get on board. Uh, so he said, yeah, I said like, okay, I've got this whole series of, of, um, crypto or uh, Picasso or Cuba, you know, crypto Cuba's paintings that I was working on. I said like, how about you animate one of these paintings? Uh, and then we dropped that as an NFT. He goes like, okay, so we kind of worked together on the, how the animation would work. We dropped that. And like I said, it was a, an absolutely massive success. Um, but there's no way I could have done that without him. You know, absolutely not. You know, and we're, you know, we're, we're the best of friends, you know, and have been for, for a long time now because we've, you know, and then we had the ETH boy uh, drop as well. And I mean, that was super cool, you know, with programmable art and async um, platform. I think these, you know, just understanding that what collaboration offers is the opportunity to, to grow and to expand and to, you know, to develop um, and broaden your horizons and the, change the way you think about things and change the way you, you think about art um, and, and especially your own art because all of a sudden you're bringing somebody on board, you're coming together and, and you have to negotiate and you have to compromise and you have to um, work together on something that you might not even know what the, most likely what the end piece is going to be. And you just have to have trust and faith that, you know, something good is gonna come out of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, then there was a pack collab. And again, you know, we, we came into it um, Knowing, having no idea what we're going to do together, none. So it was a lot of back and forth emails. We were even on the phone a couple of times uh, with Pax Voice, modulated in oh, some right. way. So okay. I had no I idea. Out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if um, Pax is male or female. Um, the, it was a female voice that I was speaking to, but it was very kind of. Um, so you know, yeah, I have, I have no idea, and that in itself was very strange. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. Uh, so again, we just said, okay, I, I threw some ideas together and at, at PAC and, and, um, you know, PAC's been like, well, maybe this is a bit too contrived, you know, like, you know, what about, 
um, let's try, you know, do something a, a bit more, um, you know, of, of us rather than trying to force something, you know. So, you know, Pax said, like, you know, how about you paint, paint something and, and I'll, you know, rework this in, in the, the pack style. So then I was thinking, I was thinking, okay, cubes. Um, and it's funny how cubes has now become a, a whole new, um, me, taking on new meaning in my mm. career. Uh, but yeah. And then it went to the, the, the six, um, artists, um, great masters, actually that one there, Damien Hurst, I brought out and I also was painted as unfinished. I did another, uh, painting of Tracy Emin, which is unfinished, which they were actually going to be part of that. Uh, and then again, we decided it's again with collaborations, you have to, you have to compromise, you have to make adjustments. So I'd already was well into these two paintings. And then we kind of came to the realization, you know, this, why are these two painting two people in this, in this, you know, when we're looking at kind of past masters. So I think that's when we brought in George O'Keefe and um, maybe Warhol uh, to kind of make the, the, the group of six. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've got tons of paintings that are unfinished in the studio here because whether it's working towards an exhibition or um, working on a collaboration, that something's just not working, then you gotta, you, you can't be precious. And I think that's another thing with, with collaborations, that to make a collaboration work well, um, they force you to, I think, reflect a lot on your own work and, and, and ask questions why, you know, why, why are you doing what you're doing? And then when you bring somebody else on board and, and you're working with them, uh, it's, it's much, much more complica complicated, it's much more complex. Um, it's a lot slower going because there's this negotiation that happens back and forth. And I think some are very successful and some maybe are not so successful, but you, you learn from every single one of them. I think it's, it's absolutely essential um, to continue to grow at, or to, to accelerate your growth as an artist by working with other people because you can very easily get stuck in your own little echo chamber and next thing you know, it's like five years go past and you're still doing the same thing. Yeah, I was about to say that. You get stuck in a rut and just re repeating yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. until, yeah, because until, yeah, you've got to justify what you're doing if you're collaborating with another artist. So this is, yeah, makes perfect sense. Mm. So your latest collaboration is with uh, rapper Ice Cube. Can you can you show us any teasers for that at all, or go into the details? I I can I can go into a little detail. Um, I'm, I can't actually show the images um, until after the drop or on the lead up to the drop. So there's four main paintings, uh, four large paintings, um, portraits, and again, like I was saying about um, negotiation, I actually had. Uh, for the plan of initially was to do one painting because I was working on other projects. Uh, and then I just got so excited about this, like, oh, this is Ice Cube. You know, the, this can be super cool. Um, so let's put the effort into this that it deserves. Um, and you don't want to piss off Cube. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, you know, let's, let's go 100% on this. And I, I started to you know, visualize uh, a story, you know, a narrative and, 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 you know, I was, had long conversations with Cube, which is very surreal because you're on the phone and I'm thinking like, you know, <laughs> like Friday or, you know, drive, uh, uh, ride along with Kevin Hart and I'm talking to Ice Cube and, you know, you say Cube, you don't say Ice Cube. It's like, so uh, Cube, can you tell me a little bit more about, uh, you know, it's like, and then he's just talking to you and you're thinking, this is <laughs> Cube. Um, so, yeah, so I, we had some long discussions about kind of him one of the initial reasons why I decided to to do this collaboration, um, well, was because we're we're pretty much the same age, him and I, almost exactly the same age, but we came from completely different backgrounds. Um, you know, for him, you know, gangster rap in inner city, you know, um, L.A. and Compton, and and me in from you know redneck hillbilly land in, in Western Canada. You know, we, we couldn't be kind of more opposite. And that's what I really, that attracted me to this because, you know, it, it's getting to know somebody who I know nothing about except other than his music and his, and his movies. Um, so that excited me, but also the fact that he was very much willing to be a part of the whole collaboration process, not only with the music that's going to be made for the pieces, but we discuss what's happening 
it's not me going, okay, I'm going to just make what I want to do. You put your name on it and throw a couple beats and, and there you go. So this has been a, going on for, for a number of months now. But yeah, initially I had this concept that uh, with four paintings and it, the, the, the narrative was amazing. You know, it had this kind of circular so you could actually kind of continue around in a circle through these, these four paintings with the story. Um, it was about choices and decisions and because we talked about his upbringing, his background. And his choice was to not pick up the gun, but to build his platform through music and lyrics. And so I thought, okay, let's work on something that, that kind of sends out a positive message about, uh, about choices and, um, and uh, you know, um, consequences and what will happen if you make good decisions and what could happen if you make bad decisions. So the plan was to have these four paintings, but he didn't actually like the two that brought it all together, oh. um, it wasn't a positive enough message. Uh, it could have been a spin, but I think it was a bit too, and, and you know, looking back at it now, it was a bit over the top because it was kind of, the whole thing was about guns. And he said like, I don't, that's not my platform. You know, it's for me, it's the microphone and the music. And so I changed the, those two paintings to, and it, I'm using uh, artificial intelligence to help create these these compositions which is very cool and he he loved it because he he loves the idea of of what ai can be used for for good and for bad again you know if it is it the you know is it the, the establishment is it the police who could potentially use ai for facial recognition mm -hmm. for for oppre for oppressing um or can the, will the people rise up and through technology so we started to to thread this narrative of, of technology into the story itself and the fact that I'm using the technology and the augmented reality and artificial intelligence to, to kind of bring it all together, uh, that's when it starts to get really, really exciting. So yeah, I wish I could show you the paintings right now or the people who are watching this, but I can't. But once they come out, it's going to be absolutely spectacular. Cool, no, that's yeah. nice insight into the extra layers you've got, part of the, part of the drop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You got a drop date? Uh, we're looking at either end of August or early September. Yeah, yeah. I've got uh, one coming up the end of this month. Actually, sorry, it'll be, the th I think, the 3rd of August is for ETH Boy. And that's with uh, Don Diablo and a lot of money. Uh, and that's amazingly cool. Um, I can't say which platform it's on right now, but who we're working with is just going above and beyond for, for working with us. It's very, very cool. Um, and that brings in another... Uh, factor with with Max Stealth, who is the original buyer of the ETH Boy uh, Async piece. Um, so again, with collaboration, it's not always just about artists. But Max, that was part of the the, the package was that whoever bought that piece, uh, we will be working with them for the next five years uh, on ten derivative ETH Boy drops. And this is the first one coming up, there'll be two a year. Uh, one's going to be. Uh, on July, th essentially around July 30th, with, which is the Ethereum network launch date anniversary, and January 31st, which is uh, Vitalik's birthday. So twice a year for the next five years, we'll be working with um, a, a guest artist uh, and Max to kind of create this this five-year journey of little Vitalik uh, and the story of Ethereum. Nice, nice, cool. Yeah. So plenty, plenty lined up. Yeah, no sign of slowing down. <laughs> no, I've got another one coming up. I mean, the work's all done, but uh, there's delays, and it's just it's it's been you know ongoing issues, and I'm super excited about it. Um, uh, and then I've got my collaboration or kind of project with um, the the Tesla SpaceX um, commissions, which is you know again I can't talk about it. So this year, as I said many times, it's been the most productive unsuccessful year ever because <laughs> I've got all these amazing things happening and these big collaborations and, and big projects. And um, I just can't show anybody any of the work until eventually we manage to, to do the drops whenever that will be. Well, thank you very much for fitting us in <laughs> into your busy, busy schedule. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Pl pleasure. And, and great to meet you guys as well. You know, like I said, a number of times um, with lockdown you know, easing and, and getting to meet people that you've only talked with online, you know, and I've, I've met uh, three or four others, um, you know, who, who have come up to Edinburgh or, or live in Edinburgh. Uh, and it's a very, very different thing to see somebody and to meet them and to talk to them and to see, you know, 
body language and but then to actually see somebody in real life and to to have a conversation get to know them that's yeah special i think i can't wait for covid end and we can all start getting together and and building real healthy relationships on that note i did ask a bunch of people if they had any questions for you and the one that came back straight away was when's the castle party (laughs) (laughs) i was going to i wanted to have it on the the anniversary of the bitcoin angel drop which was february 24th i think but then after more consideration and i was i actually met up with um madame bitcoin uh, a couple of weeks ago and went out for for drinks and we talked about it and she's super excited about it as well and she wants to get involved in the kind of the the, the, the creating of the you know the whole the whole event and she said you know february is not a good time of year in scotland you know mm-hmm. it's 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 pretty Bleak. yeah yeah so let's aim for something where we actually can have a castle and and we can be outside and we can have a party and there'll be some nice weather hopefully so probably more june july type thing we'll we'll aim for that excellent yeah but that'll be fun it's a great idea (laughs) uh it's been amazing it's great to see where you work up close and personal it's really unusual actually we were talking on the way here it's like a a case of meeting oh i can't say that I was going to say a celebrity. <laughs> no, 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 dude. <laughs> Just I'm a redneck from Canada. <laughs> I've always wanted to meet a redneck from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, perfect. <laughs> <laughs>